thank you so much for joining us to start off a new week on the NFE. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 895th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Larry Pittman and Dan Cameron. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Oliver Tompkins Ray to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we're on Lenape Hooking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Over the course of his decades long career, Larry Pittman has developed a unique visual aesthetic that has established him as one of the most significant painters of his generation. Pittman's signature densely layered painting style includes a lexicon of signs and symbols, a compilation of varied painting techniques and a clear homage to the handmade craft and the decorative. While Pittman's early works were informed by the socio-political struggle, his later paintings shift and focus towards interior spaces, including domestic and psychological subjects. And our host today, New York-based curator, art writer, and educator Dan Cameron launched his career in 1982 with Extended Sensibilities at the New Museum, which was the first institutional effort in the U.S. to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. For over 40 years, Cameron has held senior curatorial positions at the New Museum, Orange County Museum of Art, and CAC New Orleans, and organized more than 100 museum exhibitions. He also founded Prospect New Orleans in 2007, and Dan's book on Nicole Eisman's paintings was published in 21 by Lund Humphreys. I'm really, really thrilled to have you both in dialogue today, and with that, I'll pass it over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to, to do, be doing this today. I love the new social environment. I think it's been a very important way of keeping the art community connected, um, sometimes when we're indoors and then sometimes when our life at openings, at galleries has you know returned to normal. I think it's just as vital today um, as it was you know in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I'm totally... Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word stoked to be talking with Larry Pittman today because I checked uh, my own bibliography earlier and I realized that Larry Pittman's been incredibly good luck for me uh, because when I wrote an article, I was assigned to write an article about him um, from Art Forum. Um, the then editor Jack Bankowski and I had been tossing around ideas and he said, you know, why don't you write about Larry Pittman? And I did, and I handed in the article, and somewhere along the way, maybe you reflect, know a little bit about this, Larry, someone at Art Forum said, you know what, let's give Larry Pittman the cover. So in December 1992, um, my story on Larry Pittman came out, and I think it may be the only time that I've had a cover story, um, that one of my articles has been on um, the cover of Art Forum, which, you know, at the time was like being on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, I was reading the article today, and what was interesting to me is that a lot of the questions that sort of came out of Larry's work at the time are, are things that uh, continue to be very, very relevant to our lives today. Uh, I remember discussing the decorative aspects of his work um, using words like sissy um, and, you know, particular kind of self-conscious queer uh relationship to the world uh, in relation to the imagery. But at the same time, I was very concerned about the directness with which Larry was hitting themes of of pain, uh, of, of suffering, of vulnerability, of death, of loss. And um, thinking about the exhibition that's on right now at Lehman Maupin, I, I, I understood that somewhere in the middle of this uh, this uh, subject matter, this great theme, um, or maybe these two very, very different but related themes that he's taken on, is the symbology of the egg. And and I felt like in, maybe in 1992, the egg was a bit of a Fabergé 
sort of dream, almost a, a, a constructed image. And I don't see it that way in the in the current work, in the current body of work, where this egg is in the cities. It's surrounded by these, by this architecture, by this urban architecture that has this very, to me, like Dickensian H.G. Wells sort of almost metropolis Fritz Lang kind of feeling to it. It's claustrophobic um, and the, the structures are towering over the egg. And if we can sort of start from the premise that the egg is the subject, the egg is I or you or me or Larry or somebody or all of us, um, I'm interested in just asking Larry, maybe starting with the very first question, like how is the egg how do you see the egg having evolved over the last 30 years in your work as a, as a container of so much meaning? Well, welcome everybody that's listening and thank you, Dan, for this uh, conversation. Um, and um, just to maybe think about, I just came off the heels of um, uh, my retrospective at Museo Humex in Mexico City. And that was a question also that many people had there. They were able to see the egg make appearances um, throughout the body of work. Um, and one of the questions that was asked by the audience many times or has been asked in the past, what is it a symbol for? And I say, actually, I'm not really as interested in symbols because symbols actually uh, are very contained in meaning and usually the image represents something very specific and very static. Um, in looking over, let's say, the use of the egg throughout the body of work, its role is really uh, much more malleable. Uh, and like you said, maybe at the beginning, um, uh, Dan, you mentioned that you had seen them almost as Fabergé. So that means that the egg in uh, at the early on is has a different identity than the egg is having now in the recent body of work. I would say when I use imagery, it's more as a conduit for the viewer uh, to be able to access the mobility and the plentitude of metaphoric meaning as opposed to symbolic meaning. Um, so you're right. I think your take on the eggs uh, now is very, very different from when you wrote about the work in 1992 when also the egg had made a, an appearance and continues to make this appearance. So I'm, I'm more interested in the mutability and malleability of language uh, and shy away from uh, myself and hopefully the viewer would shy away from the kind of um, straight jacket that symbology usually comes with. Well, that's a great answer, thanks. And I, 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 maybe I'm more concerned in a way, about the meaning, I'll, I'll drop the idea of symbology, but the the possible meanings that are indicated by the by the buildings, uh, mm -hmm. by the architecture, because that seems to be a bit more historicist um, in some of its references. I feel like I recognize some of these buildings, um, and I and and I don't have particularly pleasant associations with them, um, mm -hmm. and and I feel that that's something relatively new. Um, I think you know. I think most. Uh, large, uh, densely populated cities by nature are uh, junky and jerry-rigged. Um, and um, I was in New York just a few days ago, and I could even say that about the built environment of, of New York as well. And certainly the, the kind of um, jerry-rigged, um, messy quality of Los Angeles, although very different from the built environment of New York, it's still jerry-rigged, um, inconsistent, um, multiple styles, multiple periods, aspirational architecture, junky architecture, tacky architecture, elegant architecture. Um, it's as if these cities almost had experienced no city planning or, um, or uh, zoning. Um, and I think that that's kind of what I wanted to get across. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, you know, if you look at, let's say the painting that we're looking at now, the very large one on, on the, um, on the, on the projection right now. Which was in your retrospective. 
which was in the retrospective. So there's kind of neoclassical buildings. They almost look like um, um, Indian pavilions, skyscrapers, um, uh, futuristic architecture, uh, dystopian architecture, uh, all occupying a kind of, um, I think, celebratory mutual company. Celebratory mutual company. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now here the um, the eggs again are are sort of uh, become spaces for different kinds of growth, different kinds of expressions of of living organisms, not necessarily just the kinds of uh, animals that would come out of eggs, but but really the proliferation of life itself. Do you see this as a as a binary that works to develop some tension, pictorial tension? Well, the, the title of the city, going back to the title of the city, Dan, it's sparkling eggs with, sparkling cities with egg monuments. So obviously these are conjectural cities. Uh, they don't really exist. Uh, and the conjecture here, the grand conjecture is what if these grand sparkling cities, instead of building monuments to war heroes, slaughter, um, war, science, banking, law, uh, the more patriarchal lineage, actually these cities would be emphasizing a matrilineal um, um, identity. And that's why um, these cities would be constructing eggs um, as their city monuments. Um, and then going to your question of let's say the future conjectural, um, the, um, all through the paintings you see these multiple life forms and in the best of all possible worlds, what these eggs would be producing would be fundamentally intersexed. Intersexed. Yes. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> no, but I, I um, can you talk a little bit more about how you got to that, to that point where, where you, where you, where these are explicitly as you described them? Well, I guess, you know, obviously the work um, has never, um, ever, ever invested in reductivity um, by nature as being a queer person and being, having, um, out an open life with my husband, Roy Dow, for 50 years. Uh, we came out in the mid 70s. Um, any type of reductivity um, was dangerous for us trying to forge a public and cultural identity, especially together as a couple. Um, so the paintings, I think, um, like there is a bit of pomposity um, uh, and a type of self-congratulation of purity regarding minimalism that I've always found problematic. Um, it is not good to be simple and pure. Um, and um, so in the light of, of um, an escalating imagery, uh, a complex, highly layered imagery of both affinities and contradictions, it made sense that um, to me to propose that in this matrilineal structure, the X would be uh, producing um, even more complex um, beings as well. And so it just progressed into the idea that if you look at a lot of the imagery, it's a kind of hybrid imagery of intersexuality, intersexed more particularly physically. And and so ha for how long do you feel that this has been a consistent thread um, in the work where where in a way you're you're developing a visual representation of a, of a conjectural society where let's say gender identity is configured in a new way, in a, in a way that has um, invented itself um, or, or self-created. Um, and, and I think that's an important um, 
I think that's an important thread to follow, maybe if we're starting to break down the iconography of the work. I think maybe this circles around and you know, um, you know, through the um, ongoing AIDS crisis, which of course continues globally um, um, and has not been resolved at all, um, only perhaps in affluent um, nations who can afford um, treatment. Um, I think that um, I dealt with, uh, I guess maybe to go back to older nomenclature, gay identity um, in the 90s. Um, and I think that over time, and even when I was very young, um, I have a clear, a pretty clear idea. I've always had a pretty clear idea of what my sexuality is, but my gender identity, I think, is um, um, much more complex and elusive um, and changing. Um, it's interesting that early on, um, I still like the old old nomenclature as much as the newer nomenclature, but I like that, let's say in your review or in, that you would hear that the word was seen as sissy or feminine, effeminate. Um, um, I was very, very excited to see a, 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 a group of four fabulous cathedral paintings by Florine Stettheimer three days ago at the Met, they're hanging on a wall. And I turned to Roy, my husband, I said, isn't it wonderful? These paintings are just populated by effete faggots. Uh, and I was just, I thought it, I was so excited and happy. Um, and so I think that, um, um, I think proposing the positivity um, and wellness of an intersex um, population um, fit into this idea of me making conjectural cities uh, of the near or far future. I don't know. Is this something that you've been conscious of all along, I, I guess, or is it something um, in particular in terms of how we are are seeing gender being redefined or gender identity being redefined sort of live in the lives of people around us uh, by our colleagues our contemporaries it, it's it's sort of um well i think i think that when i um um i guess to this day but also when i was in my 20s i really could not identify with a strain of gay culture then and now that seems to uh, emphasize a type of, um, I guess, masculinist performance. Um, and I've never um, aspired to that. Um, um, and, um, and I don't feel comfortable in, in that identity performance. Um, uh, it's just simply not me. So it has been with me um, my entire life, um, although the shading of its uh, signification has uh, has been um, informed all through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now uh, with different, with very specific particularities as well, as I think all of us are continue to evolve. I'm also thinking that your retrospective, both at the Hammer Museum and then later on at the uh, at the Humex in Mexico City, um, I'm I'm wondering how your work today reverberates uh, with a generation of viewers who may not have known who you were, you know, ten or fifteen years ago because they weren't looking at art at that time, and now they're not just seeing your work but they're actually getting the full picture. You know the the sort of the full three hundred sixty degree Larry Pittman, and I and I'm wondering if, or I'm I'm supposing that there's a response coming to you from a, a maybe a new generation of viewers that is perhaps surprising to you or, or especially gratifying in terms of the things that you're articulating now being visually palpable within the work for this for this new generation. 
Um, that's a wonderful question, Dan. And um, I, one of the things that happened uh, both at, at my retrospective at the Hammer and uh, in my retrospective in Mexico City is a whole contingency um, of viewers who were in their 20s and 30s have gravitated very, very strongly to a series of paintings that I did um, of owls, which are clearly and um, visually intersexed. Um, so the owls have um, 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 visual performances of um, being intersexed. And a lot of the questions which I was so touched by is a lot of kids would come up and he says, uh, these are trans paintings, or what are these paintings? Or um, and these are trans paintings, just yes, they just would say it. <laughs> right. Um, and I was just so excited by that. Uh, so these are this, like the one on the extreme right, the blue one is um, uh, an intersexed owl, and the one that's upside down, further down. Um, but um, it was really. You know, I think, I, of course, I, I technically come out of the pictures generation, which uh, a large group of them uh, went to, I went to school with at CalArts in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, they really are not my critical peer group. Um, I really have fundamentally nothing to do with them. Um, I was in a minority at CalArts as a painter. So, um, but that aside, I think um, my work has been contextualized not by my own generation, but thankfully and gratefully by um, ongoing younger generations. So the first moment I was able to detect that the work was actually being contextualized was when a whole generation of young female painters emerged in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, so I'm forever grateful for um, a lot of younger generations, but even that first wave of um, painters of the 90s who were able to help me um, um, contextualize my work, which had always faced a sort of, sort of critical resistance in some quarters. Um, I'm not a fool, I know that that happens. Uh, that happens to every artist, of course. Um, but um, so slowly, I think if I have a really vital, energized viewership, I would say it's um, 30 to 40 years younger than I am. <laughs> so I'm really excited by that. You would know? you be comfortable naming some of the painters from the 90s that connected to your work? Or would you prefer not to go there? Because I, I, I'm... Well, I'm no, I mean... It's still no. my mind going, well, that or Nicole, but I'm not sure. If, if, if I mean, let's say a very important painter to me of the of the 20th century is Florine Stedheimer, who I absolutely adore, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also uh, Sonia Delaunay, who um, has been bumped up in her status in history simply because the nomenclature has changed and she's no longer seen as a dilettante but as an interdisciplinary artist, which she truly was. Well, sorry, Larry, I meant more like the painters from the 90s. Um, you... In the 90s, well, yeah. like um, actually Laura Owens, Toba Kaduri, um, um, uh, from Los Angeles, uh, Charlene Van Heil, who I think uh, was, I think is a fantastic painter. Um, um, uh, well, uh, Toma Opst, uh, who I love the work, um, um, uh, Silke Otto Kanap, um, oh, like, great. You know, think you know. I think that I think I was able to kind of for the first time see myself, even though we don't do the same work. But I could see myself um, through their lens, and maybe it was, from time to time it's been reciprocated that they would see themselves through my lens. So it was really wonderful. That's really inspiring to hear. I'm glad you shared that. Um, I want to just shift gears, if I could, just a little bit and kind of talk about an identity, if you will, from another angle. Um, 
I think that even though this is the first sustained conversation you and I have had in our 30 odd years of, of acquaintanceship, um, I've noted that both your and my life lives um, have taken a specific turn towards um, the Spanish speaking world, a mundo hispano y blante. And, um, you know, for me, it's been motivated by a number of, of personal um, issues. I'm married to a Honduran man, um, Martin Cáceres, who noted my interest in Spanish art <laughs> in the 80s and early 90s, and, you know, gently suggested that I should be moving my focus towards this hemisphere. And and that's been an ongoing part of my life now since um, since the early 90s. Um, you did something else. I mean, you you are Hispanic. You're you are your mother's from Colombia. Your fam much of your family is still there. Um, you know, and without without kind of again reducing it down to any number of factors, um, you made a very big move in your life um, not that long ago um, by making Mexico City your second home. And I'm not sure everybody knows that. Um, I'm not sure how important you feel it is in the context of a discussion like this. But I do feel that when we're talking about, you know, sort of the richness and complexity and layeredness of one's identity, um, I feel that knowing that you're spending half of your life speaking Spanish on a professional level, you know, in terms of your career, that brings for me a added richness. Um, and, and substance to the work you're making. I actually see it now through yet another uh, lens, if you will. Well, um, I, I think that, um, you know, um, uh, I still use the word Latino and I, I must register here that many of, of my friends in Latin America um, don't like the term Latinx simply because they don't want um, 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 an American uh, academic term to be imposed on the complexity of what constitutes um, uh, Latin American and Hispanic culture. Um, that said, again, another thing that, um, that I've always had to um, address is of course my name, my last name is Pittman. I do not, have never used my maternal names in my name, um, which are Llorente de Rosasco. Um, and um, that uh, Latino culture is not a monolithic culture and it's also not a racial category. Of course. Um, but I think a lot of uh, Americans don't understand that. Um, it's a consortium of diasporic people, um, racial identities, ethnic identities, who uh, come under, uh, who circle around um, a language. Um, I guess what, what it is is that um, my, I've been in, um, I've been traveling to Mexico for the last, um, I would say 50 years, uh, and I've uh, started going to Mexico City in the late 70s, um, and I got to know Mexico, and Roy and I would rent a car and drive all over Mexico, and we are by nature collectors, and we've collected a lot of pottery. Um, I particularly like ceramics. I've learned a lot by looking at the ceramics from different areas of Mexico. Um, we also have a home in San Miguel de Allende, which is a small colonial town. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Roy collects textiles. So in our home, we're surrounded by ceramic and textiles, um, both from the 19th century uh, and the 20th and 21st century. Um, so how could that not somehow um, enter my interior world or also my uh, big, not just my exterior world or making it a, a part of the process of homemaking. Um, also, I think um, my, I, I'm very much a, a hybrid. My father was Presbyterian, uh, but a very um, radicalized atheist. 
and my mother was um, uh, just socially Catholic, but not practicing um, a social identity, not a religious identity. And that is, um, I think, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, most, at least in my generation, most homes were dominated by the matrilineal line. Certainly I was, so my home language is Spanish. I spoke to my mother in Spanish. I still talk to my aunts who are in their 80s in Spanish. I spoke to my father in English. But I think the imagery, um, maybe what it is is that I'm not culturally suspicious of decoration as being um, devoid of content, that it has to work at content. Uh, but culturally, um, um, I come out of a tradition that sees the simultaneity of uh, decoration as intrinsically having content and not having to work at it, which maybe could be a type of Calvinist suspicion at its core. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, as a sidebar, I would like to note, because um, I'm collecting a category over here of things that Larry Pittman was ahead of everybody else on. And maybe I can roll the oh depreciation of ceramics and textiles um, as fine art sources, not just as sources, but as um, objects and artworks that are as full of complex meanings as you know a painting and an altar place altarpiece pardon me a marble statue and and i think that the art world in just in the last couple of years has shown a a, a long delayed um but really welcome um willingness to begin to look at textiles and ceramics in particular as high art now, one could be cynical and say this has more to do with the market than an actual change in taste, but I'm going to operate on the assumption that both things can be true at the same time and return to the idea that you do seem to have been a little bit ahead of the time in terms of how your language has always been informed by these um, particular traditions um, that you don't yourself practice. I assume you don't throw pots and you don't embroider but you know how to read the histories of 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 these traditions and you know how to find a way to perhaps sensitize the viewer to seeing by way of your work uh, uh, these other modalities uh through a, a different coloring let's say well, I, I um, appreciate that observation, Dan, very much. Um, I, again, going back to the word simultaneous, I think a lot of it was um, simultaneously occurring in the, fem the first generation feminist art program at CalArts in the 70s, where um, it was, um, we were, our, my art history teacher, Arlene Raven, at that time, I um, <laughs> and, all, and, uh, and also um, my professors, Miriam Shapiro, um, Bia Selmans, uh, and um, uh, Elizabeth Murray, we were all involved in kind of revisionist art history. So, uh, you know, clearly we also studied um, the applied arts, textiles, um, decoration, architecture. Um, so it was an in incredibly rich inclusion of um, visual information as well. And not just, uh, we spent less time, people think, uh, people think that we, we were obsessing over the modernist timeline and quite the contrary, we weren't, we weren't as interested in the modernist timeline and we were looking elsewhere. So I think it was this wonderful serendipity of um, my early education. I wasn't part of the feminist program directly because uh, men were not allowed um, into the program, but I guess I always felt I was an honorary member and many of my close friends were part of that program. 
And then at the same time, Roy and I were traveling in Mexico, looking at a lot of pottery, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, incredible pottery from Michoacan, Patamban, the beautiful, just incredibly precise um, brushwork in Copula, uh, Copula pottery, mm -hmm. um, where I learned how how you put down a brush and you make a tiny little dot and then you lean on the brush and pull back to make the tail. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that um, that actually, that gesture- Come in handy. <laughs> that, uh, that gesture, that kind of performance gesture of making a dot, pressing on it and pulling back to make the circle have a tail actually is so integral in all of the paintings I make and it happens all the time, you know? So you, um, I heard getting that from a one potter in one town. So not one potter from this, this pottery known as Copula ware, um, which is made up of tiny little dots. Ah, I'm using very, very fine brushes. So it was really, it was wonderful to, to learn that. So it was this wonderful serendipity of both revisionist art history and the feminist art program and also traveling through Mexico. Um, getting back to the Humex presentation, I actually was fortunate to see both in Los Angeles uh, at the Hammer uh, and in Mexico City this past February um, at, at Humex. Uh, and I preferred it actually in Mexico City, um, maybe for architectural reasons. Um, but when you and I were talking about it the other day, because I had the, also the fortune to be able to walk through your show a little bit with you, um, you talked about a decision you made um, at the time, which was to do all the public programs um, in Spanish, that you weren't really interested in um, sort of English only uh, public programs. And I'm, I, I have done the same thing myself. I mean, I don't speak Spanish as well as you do, but I've often felt that, you know, kind of, I don't want to say enforcing, but insisting on um, ling linguistic uh, viability um, for a cultural uh, group um, that is often, how can I say, look down on for through linguistic markers. I mean, I, I've said to friends of mine visiting from Europe sometimes, I said, you have to understand that for way too many Americans, Spanish is the language of the serving class. That is how it is understood. That is how it is implicitly recognized, unless you yourself happen to be a Spanish speaker, in which case you find that predisposition horrible and unbearable. <sighs> That, that that people think of Spanish that way, this this beautiful, rich language um, with an amazing literary history somehow gets connected to class identity in the United States. But we all know that it does. And I, I'm wondering, could you speak a little bit about these decisions, like, for example, with Humex to do Spanish language programs um, in connection to a sort of English only mentality that I think is sometimes behind why my colleagues in the, in the United States always want to go to Europe to do their research um, and they never want to go to Colombia or Argentina or Chile or Ecuador to do their research, which really um, makes no sense. Well, I, I did make that decision. Um, I uh, when I met with the development people, the education department, the curatorial department, I was clear uh, in our first meetings that I would do no programming in English, um, that it would only be in Spanish, and that also we did a small little artist book, which is completely in Spanish uh, with no translation. Um, and there was a little bit of pushback uh, in America say, oh, it doesn't make the catalog as available. And I said, well, maybe not available to you, but it becomes available to all of goddamn Latin America, <laughs> which is millions of people. <laughs> so um, I, I, did the, I did it, and I think it just simply connected. Um, uh, in a very, very different way. And in the audience, you could also see 
a huge range of, of um, um, the Mexican viewing public of class structure, color, um, European, indigenous, you know, it was just an incredible range of the visual performance of Mexican culture. And again, it was a moment to address that complexity that unifies by and large around this language. Um, there are also many other languages spoken in Mexico, but, but it is the language that the overwhelming majority circle around. Um, and that made a huge difference. There was a tremendous warmth, um, reciprocity, great questions. Um, no, there was absolutely, there is no cultural allergy to the visual performance of the work. Um, as much as let's say I've had um, in more um, Western European cultures. Um, in other words, uh, they, they, it, was, it was fantastic. But I also do the same when I've shown in, I don't know German, I wish I did, but when I've shown in, um, in uh, Spain um, and in Italy, and in France, I at least always make an introductory statement in those languages as well. Um, and I think it's just, a, I don't know, I, I can, it's just a, a type of social graciousness to do that. I, I can't say it any other way. I know that sounds a bit bourgeois, but um, it is, it's a type of social graciousness and I'm thankful that they've invited me. Exactly. I had the um, strange situation last November of giving a, a talk at the ICA, the International Art Critics Association Conference, the first one post-COVID. It was in Buenos Aires, and I was speaking at the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes. And, you know, 85% of the attendees were Spanish speakers. Um, and even though I can't just wing it, I can't just improvise an academic paper <laughs> if if i could if i write the paper and it's translated i can give it in such a way that it's a, it's it's i'm understanding what i'm saying and people in the audience are understanding what i'm saying but it was the first time where i've actually looked out at friends who are english speakers in the audience listening to me with headphones on because they have to listen to the translation even though they know it's me up there speaking Spanish and I, I found that wonderfully disorienting and disarming um, in a way. Um, shifting a little bit I want to talk uh, we made another reference when we were at your uh, show to the New York School because I was pointing out to you places in the paintings where it seemed like the gestures that you were using um, had a more explicit reference than I've ever seen before to some of the, let's say, tropes of, God help us, the New York school. And I remember even when you and I were talking about, made the reference to the New York school, it was always the ghost of the ghost of the New York school or the last final postmortem gasp. Um, and that made that brought me back around to thinking about how you as a West Coast artist, as an LA artist, have always um, been able to find, and I'm gonna say opposite your an oppositional relationship to the hegemonic role of the New York school when you were coming up. Um, you know, that was that's always been a very fruitful point of departure for you so that even when you are considering the identification of certain gestures in your painting with a you know a drip based or, or a slash based uh, history it always seems to be it always seems to require scare quotes as if we can't really talk about that tradition um without you know sort of seeming it uh, seeing it in a, in a in a overly dominant sort of way. I'm I'm scrambling my ideas here, but I think you get the point I'm making. Yeah, I guess um, I guess uh, I was a young queer kid um, at age twenty, trying to figure out how to make a painting, uh, but try to make a painting where I could see um, myself in the 
long and incredible history of, and the incredible arc of painting history. Um, and, you know, when I look at, uh, so there are moments in my revisionist um, art history training that I could see my um, identity uh, in several locations in past history. I could see my reflection in it. And I think all artists want to see somehow uh, a faint reflection of themselves, even if it's in the past. Um, so when I looked at the New York School, I just uh, maybe just, I was uh, a bit of a brat when I was young and didactic. I'm still didactic, I know. Um, but um, uh, the New York School to me just felt very white, Eurocentric and heteronormative. Um, and as much as I admire it, I, uh, and, um, you know, one of my, I absolutely love Lee Krasner. I, I mean, she's at the top for me. Um, and again, I would say history, or the rewriting of history is slowly coming around to your point of view. I, I love Lee Krasner. Um, I'm sorry. And, um, I don't know. I, I wanted to figure out how to make a painting so that it wouldn't um, illustrate who I am, but um, um, but that somehow it, it's not that I was against um, those other isms. I just didn't feel comfortable or interested in replicating them or emulating them or genuflecting to them at all. Um, and I think the, um, you know, there's so many still uh, declensions of the New York school. To be honest with you, it's starting to look really retrogressive and embarrassing. You know, I mean, oh, it's it 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 seems so out of touch and um, essentialist, um, um, unnecessarily expressive. Um, uh, I don't know why um, about certain things. It just it still it still baffles me, and there are moments and I saw them when I was in New York in some galleries and in some museums as well. Some moments. Of uh, late, Where? late, 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 late New York school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean we will always cling to our traditions, I suppose. But yes. what you're describing is more of it's not that necessarily that you're feeling um that you're challenging a hierarchy or trying to um, come after a, a patriarchal oh. system um, for its own sake, but really it was the desire to invent a language or invent a, a not a language, but a vocabulary yes. that was, that was rooted in pictor painting history, um, hit maybe painting histories is the, is the right way to say it, but which would be a language that you could point to and say, you know, um, this is, this is how I want to construct this visual world that I'm inventing uh, through my paintings. I, 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 I would find it, I would have found it unbearable and would still find it unbearable to base uh, my life as an artist making paintings uh, solely against being against something, you know, uh, uh, a sort of dominant paradigm. That is such a waste of time. I, I think I would have a lot more wrinkles on my face. Um, and, you know, I, I work out of, a, I hold on very, very tightly to a sense of pleasure in the making of work. Um, and that would preclude taking on um, and being uh, all bent out of shape uh, over uh, dominant paradigms of making paintings. Uh, well, I've never heard an artist say it quite like that, where, you know, the pleasure that we get from taking in your paintings, um, you're saying that there's a corresponding pleasure that you're experiencing as you make them for us. Absolutely. Um, I, um, like, for example, um, I guess I, I, one of uh, there was a little quote in Artnet that just came out, and someone would ask me um, about painting. P 
periodic, you know, when I was coming up as being dead, I'd say the beauty of painting is that it's always been dead. You <laughs> ironically always have to give it CPR. And then more importantly, for me, the freedom that I find in painting is that it is fundamentally useless. Um, and that way I'm able in an aggressive way to protect my pleasure in making it. Um, and I never see it as work. Um, I think that's a little too, I don't know, Protestant for me. Um, I don't- um, Protestant that you wouldn't see it as work? No, I, that I would see it as work. Um, oh. um, I don't, I never think of it as work. Um, I refuse to do that. I think that would erode. I've been able to make paintings publicly for the last 50 years. Um, and in my private studio, um, the pleasure is intact. Um, and I hope that shows in the visual performance of the work as well. Well, speaking as one viewer, I can say very much so. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, and it's a bit of a cliche. I, I'm sorry That's if okay. I'm typing here. But you know the sort of oral history of artists and their retrospectives. We, we all know what's supposed to happen when an artist works for decades upon decades with gradually sort of increasing, hopefully, uh, public appreciation. And then, you know, they're 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 well along their way and they get their retrospective and they stand back and they see their entire career up until that point spread out in multiple galleries and they all have an existential crisis. <laughs> People have asked me that. Um, what a poor existential crisis. But well, let's say, um, since I taught many years at UCLA um, and I, I've hopefully been helpful to many artists in their careers and, and getting off the ground and uh, I'm solicited for advice constantly and I love that. And I always say that a big mistake that artists make after a big, either um, a one person exhibition in a gallery or in a Kunsthalle or a, or a major retrospective is you should not stop working. You should go immediately back into the studio because why would you um, want to promote a sort of denouement uh, of experience? Uh, you're, you're, you're on a high, you're, you're showing something hopefully that you're proud of. Um, and so that's one of the things, I'm back at work in my studio, my new um, panels arrive on Wednesday um, and I'm back to work. Um, and I guess what it is is that I, I look at the retrospective and I don't see it as a summation maybe. And that's why I don't fall apart. I just see it, okay, Larry, you've done as best as you could so far move on, you know? Um, and maybe that comes out of the old adage in Hollywood too, as you're only good as your last picture. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I don't, I don't waste time um, worrying about what the signification of that show was for me as the maker of the paintings. Sure. I people think about it as viewers of the paintings, uh, what the signification is, you know? So I kind of let it go. Wow, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I like the idea that you have to move on. Move on, Larry. Yeah. Actually, um, I'm, I've known Frank Gehry for a while and he's always said, keep moving, Larry, keep moving. And I said, well, what do you do? I said, and Frank Gehry always says, I put the pedal to the metal and never look back. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's, I don't know how old he is now, but he must be in his 90s. But I always remember him telling me that. No. Um, we are getting really close to the question and answer um, phase. But um, I wanted to go back just to, if, for a moment, because we're not exactly there yet, um, to something else I wanted to see if you would explore a little bit more, which is that you you mentioned that your work is always made as a group. 
that you you always have multiple um, paintings going on in the same time. Um, and I, I I know many other artists who who do that as well. Um, but I'm curious as to how you develop that approach because I do think that allows you to keep the pleasure um, factor uh, pretty high uh, during the working day. Well, I think what's, and I say this positively, what helps what working in a group uh, and working on them all at once keeps me positively insecure. Um, and that insecure state is not one of being debilitated or of um, causing non-action. Um, mm -hmm. I like the whole process of feeling slightly insecure about the course of the work. And when I'm, and part of it is this, when I'm working in a group or a group of paintings, it also helps me, um, it, it challenges it me to make them all of a certain caliber so that there is no hopefully in the best of all possible worlds, no runt of the litter. Um, uh, I mean, I think there are differences in people's opinions say I like this one more than another, but I'm really fastidious uh, and hard on myself that, that by working in a group, it keeps me slightly insecure. Um, and also that they're all propelled in a reciprocal, reciprocal and uh, equally agreed upon conversation based on what they look like. And how do you determine, I mean, are you working on, sorry, I had to readjust. Are you working on a show as such, or are you an artist who makes the paintings and the show comes along the way, or is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. Um, I realize my, I completely, realize my privilege as an artist. I um, uh, I have been uh, lucky and privileged enough to conflate really the act of making the work and the act of exhibition um, uh, as very, very related since I was young. Uh, so I'm very thankful and I realize how, what privilege that is that's been accorded to my work. Um, um, but also like right now, the works that I will start in the next couple of weeks have no destination at all. Um, I'm currently working more on, um, not exactly a retrospective, but a fairly large consortium of work, um, for the Lung Museum in Shanghai, which opens oh. July, 2024. So... Right now, um, my concentration is on that, but I also have to, um, I want to keep working and making paintings. So the paintings I am working on now have no specific destination. So that happens too, when I, I appreciate that. And that's okay. It's neither preferred that's, nor... No, no, I work all the time, so um, I... And do you have I, a date yet for your big New York retrospective or is that still being negotiated? <laughs> no one's offered. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no one has offered ever. <laughs> um, you know, maybe when I'm dead. <laughs> or maybe when some important West Coast uh, curators who are known advocates of your work <laughs> maybe come to New York to run a major cultural institution. I don't know who that might be, but yeah. Maybe no, I mean, I, I, I would love that. I've shown um, in New York since the 90s. Um, and that has been really wonderful um, to be able to fairly regularly show in New York. Uh, but um, that type of uh, institutional um, imprimatur has not happened. And I, I can understand why on certain levels too, you know. Well, I think that judging from the reaction to your work um, with the show opening last week from, I would say, 100% of the people I've talked to, um, you know, you really, you knocked it out of the park. I hate to use a sports metaphor, but you know, there's, there's the, 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 
the way New Yorkers feel about your work now um, is really um, it's 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 just straight up love, you know. So it's it's it feels great to have you here in any capacity. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear, Dan. I like hearing that that report as well. <laughs> A report from the field. <laughs> um, do we have questions? Is yeah. it time, Eleanor? Yes. Thank Go back you. Back over to Eleanor Kirchner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Larry, and thank you so much, Dan. This has been thank you, Dan. So rich, thank you, Larry. Uh, really inspiring, really generous conversation. Super lovely. Um, we've got a few questions, and I'll just let everybody know that if you want to ask a question, please do not be shy. Please raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, our first question today will be coming from Fong. You should be able to unmute. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Larry. Congratulations oh, on a fabulous show. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Need to come back and, you know, look at it carefully. And thank you, Dan, for the amazing conversation. I, I had to go to a meeting, so I just want to go first asking the question. Um, it's amazing. The I love, first of all, uh, the the title of the sh the show already say something about yourself and the work. I think the kind of energy enthusiasm is embodied in titles. You, I love your title always. But let me ask you this quick question. Um, you know, everything Victorian invention is always your most identifiable uh, mediation. When every time I I see your work. I mean, it covers so much topics from gay culture, your huge appetite, Larry, for painting culture, including admiration for various painters that you just mentioned. I should also add in a in, in in including the kind of urban energy that you described just also a while ago. I can't help but thinking, you know, Dan, uh, see what you, this makes sense at all. Uh, but I remember it must have been in the mid thirties when Paul took a trip. I think he was twenty three or twenty four years old, all the way to Dartmouth to see the Orozco epic, uh, the epic of American civilization mural. Remember, which uh, which is all about destruction, myth, ritual, sacrifice, and whatnot. And then I couldn't. Uh, help but also think since I was in Detroit not long ago, Diego Rivera, the Detroit industry mural, also painted pure much the same year, 33, 34, I think, uh, which is considered to be communistic, you know, <laughs> sacri-religious and anti-American and whatnot, because the worker was being featured so prominently in the mural. Um, so thinking about that, in terms of urban energy. I wonder whether, since you talk about your Spanish heritage, you know, whether that have a certain kind of subconscious alchemy in that similar energy, because Pollock loved the mirror, Mexican mirror, just for that reason. So that's number one question, Larry. Number two is what? Uh, I but also, I also think of, uh, Parmigianino, you know, self-portrait in the convex mirror. It's the same title that uh, Dan and, and, and my old friend, the great poet John Ashbery, that great book. Was it 1975, Dan? Yes, I think so. Okay, so that too, so there's a certain kind of energy coming from uh, Mexican mirrorless and the sensuality come from the mirrorless paintings. All right. Does that make sense or not? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, um, in full disclosure, um, I um, I was I was saying earlier, um, uh, my partner, my husband Roy, and I have always been collectors of art since we were very young. We started by trading with our um, um, our friends who are artists, and. Later on, um, you know, we were both able to make a little money and we were always in debt and still are buying work and making payments. Uh, so over the years I've collected, uh, I'm concentrating on 
true Latin American art. Um, I have three beautiful, beautiful, fairly good sized drawings by Diego Rivera in my collection. Uh, one that we borrowed, we lent to the exhibition that uh, uh, started in San Francisco Art Museum. Um, I was so happy to see the exhibition Vida Americana um, at the Whitney, uh, which mm -hmm. I thought was fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, the catalog is also great. And I've always revered Diego Rivera. I, I also really love his early um, Cubist paintings when he was a young man living in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, his Cubit, there's one where there's a painting actually I saw a few days ago at the Met where it's a, it performs as a Cubit, Cubist painting, but you can tell there's, uh, the, instead of a uh, Toile de Jouis, there's a, a Serape and then a little medallion instead of Le Journal, it mm -hmm. would be a, a little medallion says Benito Juarez, you know. So he <laughs> brought his spin to uh, to even early Cubist paintings uh, while he was living in Paris. I don't know, there's something about Diego Rivera as great, as great as an artist. Um, he is, he actually still remains an underappreciated, I know that sounds weird to say, underappreciated and undervalued. Um, I, and, um, um, uh, I study the murals. I have the big book on all his murals. And one of the right. things that always strikes me is that he starts first with the architecture of meaning, not the specific paintings within paintings. And that's something mm -hmm. I learned from him very early on. Set up the architecture of meaning. What is the mm -hmm. formal device that will welcome all these disparate elements. So in the new paintings, obviously, the architecture of meaning is both the city and the egg. And that all can already welcome uh, the idea of, of paintings within paintings or disparate moments coming and gathering around the architecture of meaning of a painting. And he does that all the time. Uh, he's, a, I think, an incredible, uh, incredibly intelligent person because he starts with the formal structuring of the event and then goes into the structure and then um, starts um, infusing and including content within that architectural arm armature that he does. Um, so that to me, it's always, I, I know all the murals, I visit them. Um, I think of all of them, he is uh, my favorite, I think. Sequeiros gets a little, um, a little maybe too melodramatic for me. Um, there's a type of um, uh, fury and melodrama. I, I love how um, that um, Diego Rivera's didactic nature is one of just simply presenting. He presents disparities. He, you know, he he. Lay, it's kind of a very theatrical and frontal. And Sequeiros, I think, tends to be uh, maybe in that sense, a little too Baroque um, mm -hmm. uh, muralist for me. Yeah, yeah I, it, I couldn't agree more. The architecture of meaning, that's super right on. He was actually a very good friend with Jack Lipchick too, in that time, 13, 14, just right before the tail end of his Cubist painting, Larry. But what about... Again, mannerist painting, the sensuality, the eroticism of that great period where not just Parmigianino, but also Bronzino and others. Well, I love mannerist painting, um, but I, again, I locate it more um, within um, um, magic realism and mm -hmm. uh, surrealism that uh, not only found its roots in Latin American cultures, yeah. but also to this day continues unabated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it has not stopped and I love that. Um, but um, in terms of mannerist painting, um, I think, uh, or mannerist surrealist painting, Remedios Varro is at the top for me. Um, yeah. She's absolutely um, the queen of it all for me. 
Uh, and I, I am excited. I'm going to try to go see her retrospective, which is at the ICA Chicago right now. Uh, an amazing retrospective of 60 paintings of Remedios Laro. Um, mm -hmm. Incredibly skilled painter, huge leaps of logic and fantasy, um, endless contradictions, uh, a joyfulness, a lightness, a mannerism, excess, folly, embarrassment, I don't know, all of it. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, I always think of that as mannerist attributes. Yeah, well, that's just terrific. Thank you so much. I was thinking about neo-romanticism too, but that's just safe on another subject. Thank you so much. So much, Larry. Congrats on the show. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Eleanor. And uh, please go see the show, everyone. Bye. Thank you, see you Fong. See you later, Fong. Thanks so much for that question. There's time for a couple more questions. Yes, we do have more questions. Um, okay. The next question will be from Veronica. Um, you should be able to unmute Veronica. Yes, it's kind of, my questions for, uh, uh, are, are kind of related for Larry from the last questions. Um, I was thinking about Rufino Tamayo and Tarsila, Tarsila do Amaral, her big egg. From Brazil, from Brazil. Yeah, from Brazil, yeah. And even Mata, Roberto Mata from Chile. And I was thinking, not, you know, your influence, but um, your vision of how Latin American cities and South American cities are so different from the Northern cities. And I'm thinking about Lima, Peru, El DF, um, Sao Paulo, and, and how maybe that would read into your work. And what do you think of the artists I mentioned? Well, uh, first of all, um, I, I, I guess what when you when you mention this list of artists, it also fills me with a type of sadness that so many um, uh, artists, really, more specifically from the United States, don't know their work, you yeah. know, or, or don't know the incredible visual history, especially um, Latin American modernism. Uh, uh, all through the 20th century is an amazing output. Um, and American museums are very slow in the catch up. I think what we're seeing now uh, with the gift of the Cisneros collection or promised gift of the Cisneros collection to MoMA and many museums are now setting up initiatives of Latin American art and having boots on the ground more um, is really important. Um, I would say one of the things, let's say in Mexico City, that when you go to the Zocalo, which is the main plaza, so you are seeing um, buildings around the Zocalo, which are from the 17th century um, and onwards, um, and then the cathedral, and then behind the cathedral are the excavations uh, that go on. Um, of um, the indigenous culture and um, the architecture that was produced. Um, when you go through certain subways, there are vignettes. Uh, I haven't been on the subway in a while, uh, but I remember going through the subway, which was constructed for the uh, Olympics uh, in the, I don't know, 60s or 70s, I'm not sure, 68 Olympics. 68 Olympics. Yeah, and so there's a there's a couple of stations where you walk around underneath, and they've preserved what they found underground. So it really is a layered city. Then you go uh, to Polanco, where you have great great uh, examples of Art Deco architecture. Um, so just simply, it's it's uh, like a lot of Latin American cities. You're living both in a museum uh, and in a contemporary culture as well. Um, and you, you know, certainly when you, you know, when all of the old cities have constructed uh, subways like in Greece constantly and Rome constantly, our things are being unearthed. When you go underground, uh, it reveals the layers of the, of the cities. So, you know, you see the colonial period very strongly so I think that that's something that, um, let's say, 
cities in America don't quite have that, um, no pun intended, depth, physical depth even. I always, whenever I take someone to Mexico City, I the first stop is the Museo de Antropología, because yeah. I think that in, in if you can really perceive of Mexican culture, not just in terms of centuries, but in terms of millennia, uh, it gives you a different idea of where you're walking. You're understanding it more like Rome or more like Cairo or more like Athens, uh, as opposed to a city in the United States where as you as you mentioned, we don't. That's not available. That 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 layering of m several millennia of culture on top of each other just simply does not exist. I mean, going also, uh, Veronica, back to your list of artists. I just wrote down other artists that I admire so much from Latin America, who are also, let's say, uh, outside of Remed uh, like Remedios Varo or Maruja Mayo. Um, you know, they left Europe during the Spanish Civil War. Um, but also Leonora Carrington, who ended up living in Mexico City, Leonor Pini uh, from Argentina. Um, you know, it's just this incredible wealth of imagery um, that um, I think continues to reverberate and continues and actually a sec having a second life, going back to what we were saying, Dan, about who views work and starts reappreciating. It's actually this wonderful kind of moment that we're seeing among young painters in America who are looking at surrealism again and the possibility of imagery that takes big leaps of logic that are not gratuitous, you know, uh, but are joyful and dense and informative at the same time. Uh, so that's actually, Veronica, some of the other painters that I've looked at and admired tremendously. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was a really great question. Um, and thank you, Larry and Dan. Um, I would like to ask you a question, Larry. Um, so I'm wondering, you haven't spoken yet much to the words that you include on in your works sometimes, and they take different forms. In, in the Lehman Mopton show, they're a little more um, kind of you know, they, they stand out a little less. They're a little more integrated into the scene of the work. And in the CDMX show, they seemed to be a little bit more popping out. Um, and I'm just curious if you could speak more to your choice of words and also, you know, the significance that they have in your practice and thinking about using like the English words in the paintings from the Mexico City show. Um, and then just, I don't know if this fits into that question, but just if there, I was thinking about it a little bit in context of your constructions of utopia and, uh, you know, queer ideas of utopia and, you know, kind of bringing elements of like our current reality into your creations of utopia. So I don't know if, if any of that sticks or makes sense. First of all, Eleanor, I like that you use the word wor words as opposed to language or text, because they are words. I think it, it is different. Um, and actually, it started really, I have, I, we did a, I still have, I don't have this painting, but um, there was a painting I did in 1978, where um, in the tradition of retablo painting, where you dedicate, or actually not retablo painting, ex voto painting, where let's say you've had a tragedy in your life and you want to say thank you to the Virgin of Guadalupe or something like that, you write a little text and saying, thank you so much for saving my life or whatever. But in this painting of 1978, written in Spanish on the bottom is uh, saying that I painted this retablo um, in honor of Gustav Mahler and his piece, Das Lied von der Erde, um, and then I said, pintado en el pueblito de Nuestra Señora del Rio de Porciúncula, um, which is the old traditional name of Los Angeles. Uh, Rio Por, the, el Rio Porciúncula is the Los Angeles River. Uh, so that was a painting in 1978 that I did. So there I was just simply saying, no, this painting doesn't so solidly come out of Eurocentricity. Um, and that was a kind of a putting my foot down a bit. But then over the years, I've used words like in the owl paintings, which are more um, direct address in the declarative um, imperative voice that say, get out. It says to the viewer, get out. 
you know, or um, I did a collaboration a while back with Dennis Cooper, the writer Dennis Cooper, and I thought that I would embarrass him because in the text he kind of makes it's you know it's a very there's a really you know it's very raw text and vulgar at times in the book, and he makes fun of I guess an image image he had of me of, of being a, a kind of a traditional well behaved boy I guess really funny. Um, um, but so I lash back and we would correspond. I'd send them these images and the images always start with dear Dennis, all my best, sincerely, Larry. So I was just simply, even though he was writing the most atrocious things about me in this, these collaborative, we did three books and they're fabulous, but I would fight back with my way of approaching it with a kind of, um, almost traditional etiquette of starting a letter, Dear Dennis, Sincerely Larry. And we kind of went back and forth and that's how we constructed the narrative. And then now, um, you know, so I like, many times I like to use the words as a form of destabilization of the viewer because it's, kind of, they don't really, they're not, I think they're not so, so um, heavyweight in their role. They're, they're kind of sign-offs like um, hasta luego, adios, hasta pronto, um, or here, abrazos, Mary. You know, it's, it's a, a kind of sentimental and embarrassing at the same time, but I love periodically including that personal vulnerability in the work as well. So that's how it functions in the newer work. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to consider that. Um, so yeah, it's been so such a great conversation. And we do have our final question from our friend GE today before we move into our poetry reading. So GE, take it away. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Larry. What an honor. Um, do you think placing the eggs in the midst of the metropolis can spur the imagination to sort of re-enchant us, bringing the, the unseen into focus and reconciling mind and matter in inner and outer realms? Well, I guess we have, a, I mean, part of it is, is a, a type of, uh, that the first impetus is to see these eggs among the city. There's a strange dislocation. Um, they're, strange they've made an appearance you know that they almost feel like they've um they're not even announcing themselves they've made it an in, there's an incongruity also that's being trafficked here um they um you know they're they're uh, the eggs are beautifully turned out well dressed um well articulated decorated um and um, they appear as, there's a certain incongruity to their appearance, also in the way they're painted. There's a, they, they have more volume than the rest of the city. The, the rest of the city feels almost like patterning or paper thin. Um, and all of a sudden that these eggs have a volumetric presence to them. Um, but at the same time, they, they, there's a self-consciousness to the gesture uh, from my part. I know they're incongruous. Um, maybe I go back to the, the wonderful term magic realism, um, you know, that, that, there's a, that there is that simultaneity of it being magical and realistic, uh, as opposed to surrealism, which is, surrealism hovering above or below um, realistic cognition. Magic realism, the title alone sets up simultane simultaneity. So I guess I'm always interested in, in that simultaneity, but also disruption or dislocation. Does that kind of Yes, it does. And also I was I was even I was even flashing on this initially because I felt the sort of Jungian kind of feel to some of this too. So but but this this is so close to, to, to zeroing in on it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, GE, for closing out our Q&A. And thanks again, Larry, for your generous answers to all of these questions. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of closing our events with a poetry reading. And today I'm really excited to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Oliver Tompkins Ray, to the stage. Oliver Tompkins Ray is a writer and songwriter from New York City who currently lives in Tucson with his dog. He played in Patti Smith's band from 1995 to 2005, and he's released two solo albums. His new album, Being Gone, will be released in 2024. His poems and writing have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, among other publications. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon, Oliver, and over to you. Thank you. Um, so happy to be part of this conversation. And uh, I thought I would read a little piece from a book I'm writing uh, called The Spoon Thief, which takes place in New York City and uh, is a lot about growing up in a city and um, life in a city. So maybe uh, a bit of a detail if we moved inside of Larry's painting, beautiful paintings and, and, and um, the consciousness that might exist within there uh, as an individual, as a young man or person and uh, also the collective mind of a city and all the reflection that happens in the city with the windows and window gazing and uh, and then the reflecting on a city uh, from afar. Um, uh, so anyway, this is a, a moment called the brain in the window, thinking about thinking. And it's uh, the character of the book is uh, come across a, a brain in a jar and a human brain in a jar in a window. And so this is the moment where this piece begins. The brain in the window, thinking about thinking. At the center of the window display, surrounded by skeletons and skulls, a mongoose mounted on a piece of stained rosewood, one leg extended forward, frozen and animate, a perfect puzzle, bleached white and emptied of everything it contained and supported, pure, ancient symmetry of ribs arcing out from the curved spine, the spine itself links in an interlocking chain of skulls and reflecting the serpent skeleton prototype of our spines coiled beside it, each bearing fangs from elegant jaws, the serpent's flat skull ready to strike the mongoose. And an assortment of butterflies impaled on little metal rods floated on their pretty colored wings, which were like sketches of eyes, everywhere book matched symmetry hovering above unimaginably ancient fossils of radiolaria, crinoids, ammonites, patterns and patterns of patterns, patterns that lived, that were creatures, that moved, each with their own consciousness or non-consciousness, mysterious thought worlds that experienced their environments and the times they existed, and teeth in bowls, long fangs, no longer ivory colored, but gray from being buried so long, absorbing millennia of minerals. And amidst this menagerie of creation of the unseen revealed a few human skulls, comical somehow, or critical of the frozen jungle around them, exquisite, buttresses of the mandibles, gothic cathedrals, the vaulted eye sockets, a sphenoid bone, itself a butterfly, the delicate brow, a wing, the crest fissure, seams running along the top and out like tributaries of rivers. At the center of all this, 
in liquid the color of old paper, a human brain floating in a bell jar. It appeared a few weeks before, and the spoon thief stood there mesmerized, entranced, high, walking home as slow as possible in the hopes the lights would be out and he could slip in undetected. He stood there entranced by this human brain suspended in liquid, floating in this beautiful jar. It had been someone, had walked and talked, cried and laughed. It had explained all the things. It had a family. It had been someone as he was. It got him started thinking about thinking, thinking about himself thinking, all those skeletons and butterflies, all those things he was made of too, vanished in the awareness of himself standing there on Columbus Avenue, looking through his reflection in the plate glass at the display on the other side, at this brain in a glass jar, in the awareness of a creepy feeling that made no sense. Somehow he was this thing he was looking at, and this thing he was looking at was contemplating itself within him at that very moment as the cars passed behind him, reflected before him in the window. How was it possible to witness this witness witnessing which had once witnessed itself witnessing. The pot was strong. However, it all reminded him of a time long before when he had become aware of breathing so much that it became difficult to breathe. There must be some other location from which we are able to witness ourselves as he was witnessing this brain in the window, some avenue and plate glass window, some display, some sidewalk outside all of this, where something beyond us and us at the same time stands. Thank you. All right. Wow, thank you so much, Oliver. That was a wonderful extension of the conversation. Um, and a huge thanks again to Larry and Dan for the thank wonderful you, dialogue. Yeah, thank you all for tuning in and thank you McKenna and the team at Lehman Maupin for supporting as we prepared for today's event. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Rail has been a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and our public events like our daily NFC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our work here at The Rail and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for an exciting conversation with Pippa Garner and Fiona Duncan. We will conclude with a reading by Leith Ayogu. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the day. Oh, thank you, Larry. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Larry. Congratulations. Go see the show, everybody. Go see the show. Thank you, Larry. Great talk, Larry. Thank you.